puntuales a la cita, ya es la hora de la conversación de eh, Isabel Legaló, la directora de la Fundación de Alineal y Nina Caraso, con Miranda Masí, que está, veo que ya está allí en Nueva York conectada. Saludos, Miranda, saludos desde España. Le paso la palabra a tu contertulia, Isabel Legaló, Miranda Masí. Adelante, Isabel. Hi, Miranda. Hola, Miranda. Eh, bienvenidos, bienvenidas todas, queridas fundaciones, en esta cuarta edición de Demos. Es un placer recibiros en esta sesión, eh, yo creo que por dos razones. La primera es porque nos hemos echado mucho de menos en esos tiempos que hemos vivido, ¿verdad? Eh, han sido tiempos complicados, difíciles, y yo creo que necesitábamos ya estar juntas y sentir que juntas podemos eh, avanzar, inventar y aportar soluciones. Y dos, porque muy a nuestro pesar, eh, la crisis económica, social y sanitaria que vivimos hoy eh, no es la única. Viene o ya está aquí otra más grande, más dura, más injusta, si cabe, que es la crisis del cambio climático. Y hoy tenemos una oportunidad para hablar sobre lo mucho que podemos hacer, lo mucho, lo fácil que es dar el primer paso y lo enriquecedor que puede ser el camino. Así es. Mucho, fácil y enriquecedor. To talk about this, we have today with us uh, Miranda Massi. Thank you so much, Miranda, for being here with us. Your initiative is absolutely fascinating and uh, it was a real pleasure to uh, dive into it and uh, know it better. Um, the Miranda Massi is the founder of the Climate Museum of New York. Um, it's a visionary museum which inspires uh, learning, dialogue and action um, through a set of um, experiential expositions and um, a group of uh, interdisciplinary programs for all ages in a manner that really unites the people in the society uh, around education and solutions on, for climate change uh, in order to move together towards um, uh, a safer future and a more just future. Um, the Climate Museum, Miranda, is incredibly innovating and we're so lucky to have you here today to explore it together. Um, what I would like to explore with you and you to talk about is our common future and the role art has to help us reach it. Um, so tell us first, maybe, Miranda, what is in, w in which can we consider that the Climate Museum consists? What, does it co what is its collections? What does it contain? How does it work? Wonderful. Um, first of all, muchísimas gracias y buenas tardes. I apologize that my Spanish does not permit me to address you all in Spanish. Um, but I want to say first how grateful I am to be with you, Isabel, and for the opportunity uh, to take part in this conversation and to witness Spanish foundations, institutions of public trust and popularity coming together to address climate change is profoundly inspiring and something my colleagues and I and the American public with which we interact will be so uplifted to hear about. So thank you all in, in the conversation. Um, the Climate Museum it comes out of an impulse to act on the superpowers that museums and other institutions like Spanish foundations that hold public trust and accountability on the one hand and that are very popular and beloved on the other hand to mobilize those superpowers for action and awareness on climate. Um, and we do this through programming in the arts, as you mentioned, through interdisciplinary programming across the arts and sciences, through youth educational programs, we fit the tools to the goal of making people feel empowered to take action on climate. Because in the United States, at least, a large majority of people are aware that we face a crisis and they're very anxious and worried about it but because we feel so small as individuals in relation to that crisis, and also because we've been taught to feel guilty and to understand that crisis as a product of our personal consumption choices, rather than as a choice, as a product of social structures and political decisions, 
um, we tend to shut down. So we know that it's a problem. We're worried about it. We feel guilty. We feel outscaled. We feel too small and we shut down. The Climate Museum exists to take that majority of the American public who are worried but silent and turn us into climate protagonists. Um, and we have found that cultural programming, interdisciplinary and arts-based cultural programming is an almost magical tool for achieving that goal and for causing people to feel that they're part of a community that is taking action and that that action is therefore meaningful because it is in community. Thank you so much, Miranda. It's very inspiring. I love that you talk of the of the silent. Um, you know, as you mentioned, the Spanish foundational sector is getting united around the climate issue, no matter which is the mission of one of each of these foundations. They are starting to recognize and want to get into action together in order to bring solutions from every sort of field that they can be working on. And we did uh, very recently a, um, a survey and we found out that 90% of the Spanish foundations are, as you were saying, they are aware of climate change, right. of the urgent issue that we are all facing here and that we might be talking of the risk of extinction of our own species if we are not able to move um, out from the current system of production uh, that we are having. So 90% is aware, 90% is willing to move in this direction, but only 18, 18% eight of these foundations has actually already incorporated some line of action. And that reminded me, it's very much in line with what we are saying, and it reminded me um, a recent article from Mary Anais Heglar, that I know you know very well, yeah. that she was yeah. mentioning exactly what you're saying, that on an individual standpoint, there is a narrative of, um, um, how, did, how did she say, hang on, I'm going to look for the, um, impotencia, um, Powerlessness, powerlessness, powerlessness. Um, soledad, uh, solitude, uh, isolation, solitude. Okay, powerlessness, solitude, and taboo and stigma around uh, climate change. And I, I think what is interesting is that here we connect arts with the question of narratives. And I would like if you can give some words about exactly how, through the Climate uh, Museum and the, program, the programming that you do, you are able to move that narrative to another uh, field. Fantastic, yeah. And uh, let me just start by saying, again, how amazing it is that all of you are coming together to start to work on this. And the very first thing I want to say before I talk about some of the work that we've done, and this is harder for existing institutions than it is for a new one like us. So it's easier for us to do what I'm about to say, and I want to acknowledge that at the top. The important thing is to start. <laughs> and the important thing, the second important thing is to know that it won't be perfect at first and that you have to keep making corrections. And that will be true forever because the climate crisis is changing very quickly, it's accelerating very rapidly, and most importantly of all, public understanding of it is changing at warp speed, just super fast. Um, so things that we did six months ago, things that we wrote, emails that we sent to our followers no longer make any sense at all because now we've had a whole election in the United States where climate was a central issue, something we've been fighting for for decades mm -hmm. and suddenly it happened and now everything is different and there's a whole new set of possibilities and a whole new set of struggles and fights. Um, so the important thing is not to be worried about being perfect and to get started. <laughs> um, with that, I'll talk about our very first exhibition which was beautiful and profound as an experience for me personally and for our team and for the visitors, but which also made clear to me ways we needed to do more to, to combat that sense of isolation, powerlessness and stigma that Mary Hagler talks about. Um, and that show was called Inhuman Time. It consisted of an original film that we commissioned four and a half hours long, taking visitors down through the Greenland ice sheet and therefore through 110,000 years of climate history. 
Um, and it was a show very much at the intersection of the arts and the sciences. And it was beautiful. We created a small chapel to science, a secular chapel with a beautiful sound score, beautiful music and this spectacular turquoise light of the moving ice spilling into the room. Um, and people absolutely loved it and had a deeply spiritual experience there. But my sense, looking back on it, as we assessed it after the fact, was that we hadn't done enough. We created a space for emotion and communal sensibility. And those are two preconditions for the cultural shift on climate that we need for the shift toward a clean energy economy and culture. We need emotional spaces and we need communal emotional spaces. And we did that, but we didn't give people a sense of what they could do specifically to take action on those feelings and on that new sense of possibility. People need those on-ramps and they need guideposts in order to know what to do with a new sense of potential and a new sense of connection to a climate active community. And so while that first show was a huge success and a joy to be part of and to present to the public, it also made us realize we needed to do things, um, we needed to do more programming adjacent to our arts programming with our next show, um, which we went on to do and, and, and we can talk about that more. But I raised that in part because I think it's really important, again, to get started and to accept imperfection from the outset. We're all experimenting in this. This is the biggest crisis our species will ever have faced, no matter how it comes out. If we do really well, it will still have been the most important thing ever to have happened to our civilization and our species. Um, and we're not gonna get it right first time out. Yeah, exactly, yeah. It's so important to, uh, to, to, to say it once and again and again and again. The, the important here is to make the first step and to start moving. And if we can do it together, we are certainly going to add good things to the story. And, when it, and this is a learning path as well. We totally agree here with you also on the fact that it is the right moment to act. It, I think there hasn't been more possibilities uh, to start uh, doing and changing to go towards a, um, a life economy than any, any time before. So it's a good moment to really start testing things that are really different. Just to try to, um, to give a, a very practical message to uh, foundations maybe that have a cultural uh, line of action here in Spain with regards to climate change. Um, with some experts and works we've done in the past, we identified sort of three levels uh, that you can activate when you want to work through arts on climate change. And one is sort of a very basic or something everybody knows better, which is a question of sustainability within operations. I do not have a too, a too heavy um, a carbon dioxide print and that, you know, I work on the sustainability of my operations. The second mm -hmm. level would be the programming level, so to sensibilize and uh, put the issue on the table and make sure people start feeling emotionally the, the problem. And the third one would be uh, arts and sciences and the way that arts can help investigate and can help imagine new futures. Would you agree with this split? First questions that you've mentioned all of this already. And second, what are the, the first steps that you can imagine for, for example, a Spanish foundation that wants to go in this direction? What is the baby step that you would say, start with this and the rest of the line will be designed? Excellent. I, I, I agree with the split. I see the second and third stages as interpenetrating enough that um, they're a Venn diagram and they're, 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 there's a gray area between them, but I definitely think the categories make sense and are very helpful for, for planning an approach and for strategizing an approach, um, which is super important because in addition to getting started, you need to have a general strategy and a goal. And I think that your, scheme, your schematic is very helpful along those lines. I'll, I'll start with the first level um, for us, it's very important. We, we are going to start publishing our greenhouse gas footprint 
um, and making clear what efforts we're taking to reduce it. It's somewhat challenging for us because we don't have jurisdiction over any space yet. We exist in borrowed and public spaces. Um, and the last thing we wanna do is cast dispersions on somebody who's loaning us space. Um, but being transparent about the um, impact of our operations is very important and adopting best practices as a way of showing that it's possible is very important. There's one caveat though that I think is equally important, which is you have to take those steps and then you have to communicate about them really transparently mm -hmm. and in a way that acknowledges along the lines of the Mary Heglar piece that you just mentioned, Isabel, where she says among other things, I don't care how many hamburgers you eat. We also have to acknowledge that we're all embedded in a fossil fuel economy and culture right now. That's why the problem is so difficult to change. Um, so the individual choices that we make, even as institutions, are important for modeling efficiency and modeling um, more sustainable practices. But what we really need to change is the system. So it's the cultural work that we do to build community around a shift toward a clean energy economy and culture that will make the most difference. But on that first step, which is nevertheless important, the key thing is to communicate about the decisions that we're making. And for us at the Climate Museum, this has primarily involved um, a, 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 a policy around um, partnerships and funding. So we don't accept funding that's linked to fossil fuel interests, um, for example. And we have shifted our finances to a fossil fuel free bank. Um, and we're about to publicly announce that. This is our first public announcement of that um, because the money that flows from American banks toward the fossil fuel industry is one of the main reasons that we have such an intractable problem right now. Um, and that's a way that we're changing our operations to move in a direction of sustainability. So is it about personal or institutional level consumption? Yes. It's also about communicating about that, acknowledging that we need to change the underlying systems and about civic engagement and advocacy that can help um, induce that systemic change. Thank you so much, Miranda. While you are talking, I was writing here one of the pieces of um, Climate Signals your exhibition, your moving exhibition, says abolish, co um, how is it? Abolish colonialism. Coal, coal like carbon, right? Yeah, yeah. very interesting. I, I um, take the opportunity to tell to the audience that you have in the chat that you can access the direction, the uh, website of the Climate Museum. And I really encourage you to go there and surf um, and look at all the different exhibitions. It's a, it's a museum that started without uh, proper space, right? And that is disseminated. It is so interesting and so innovative, the manner they, they, uh, they are working and they started. Um, Miranda, I, from what you just said, I am, um, I've brought a, a few more words here that resonate much with the coalition, the pact that we have written for the foundation, the Spanish foundations, and we already have 38 that have signed, and we know 40 more that are in the process of signing, which is, oh yeah, it's a really um, rapid movement. It's really fantastic. And here you talk of being transparent, transparent, inspiring, best practices. I just wanted to take the opportunity to say that the next step for the Pact of the Spanish Foundation is to start working together. The collective aspect is also very important in your work in the Climate Museum. And um, we are going to have work groups to be uh, progressing together in the same direction for each of the pillars that we have identified. And one is fossil fuel, make sure it's out of our uh, investment. Um, our footprint, let's make sure. And we are going to do this work all together. I have a question also that um, it was very much in the, 
in the conversation between the foundations, this task force that wrote in a, ma a participative manner uh, the pact that we are going to present just after, um, one of the questions was about um, whether we had to call this a climate emergency, a, a social and climate emergency, or if the social aspect of this whole crisis, we, all, we are all aware it is very much uh, linked, but it is not always so easy to make the link between the two. Your personal professional profile shows this connection and the work of the Climate Museum as well. Can you tell us more about this connection between the two issues? Absolutely. I, I think the, the, the climate emergency is, touches every significant aspect of the human experience at this point. Public health, um, urban design, agriculture and food supply, and also very deeply social inequality and social justice. Um, and the two, these crises have gone into each other's making. So in the United States, as I'm certain everyone there is aware, the racial hierarchy, the racism at the center of American social and political life has been exposed in this year, not at all accidentally, um, by coronavirus, which is itself a product of land use practices that cause climate change. It's, it's all the same crisis in the end. Um, and that crisis in racial justice in the United States is now very broadly understood to be connected to the climate crisis in a mutually reinforcing way. And that's a huge step forward for cultural makers and for advocates on climate because that understanding due to the crises that have erupted in the United States is now, I think, uh, general. It's generally accepted by the climate community that racism is a problem that has to be addressed along with the climate crisis, that you can't, in other words, have simply technical solutions to the climate crisis by putting up a bunch of solar panels um, and expecting that to resolve the underlying questions that have to do with how we relate to each other, who suffers the greatest burdens of environmental impacts who is being hurt first and hardest by the climate emergency as it develops, and what motivations went into the creation of the climate emergency. It has always involved what we call in English um, sacrifice zones, communities that are thought by those in power to matter less so that their interests, their health, their well being. Um, can be set aside for the advancements of the interests and health and well being of others. That dehumanization, which in the United States is very strongly based in racial hierarchy and caste, has to be set aside in order for us to make progress together in an equitable and sustainable way on the climate crisis. And my I brought this kind of lens to the work on the museum from my previous work as a civil rights and social justice trial lawyer in the United States. That's what I did before starting the museum. Um, and I um, became very aware of the intersection between American racism, which, mm -hmm. has, it, which is severe and defining as, as I'm confident our audience knows, um, and uh, environmental harms. So initially my interest was in where toxic facilities, which include by the way, power plants are sited. Where are they located? What communities bear those burdens? Um, and in, the, in, in, um, in American English, we call those frontline or fence line communities. Um, those are the communities that are hit first and hardest by the climate crisis that have been fighting back in an activist way for the longest period of time and those are the communities that can lead the way forward in helping us to understand how deep the links between racism and the climate emergency go, both in the United States 
And if you look at international inequalities, what nations, if you have a map of the nations that have contributed the most to the climate crisis in terms of cumulative emissions, and then you put next to it a map of the nations that are most vulnerable to the climate emergency and suffering the most right now, those maps, I used to have this on my bulletin board at work, those maps are almost mathematical inverses of each other. It is, it is a profound expression of inequality on the international level and even within nations. And for us to make progress that is lasting and sustainable, and that includes the whole community, addressing those issues has to be at the center of our efforts on climate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating, yes, yeah, so how much we have. If we had had a, a more equal world, right? And um, yes. a less extractive economy, Yes. We would have been, well, we wouldn't be in the same situation today, and we'd probably have um, much more capacity to invent solutions and to invent new forms of living and producing uh, the services and the goods that we need to live. There would be much more equilibrium with, uh, with nature. Exactly. <laughs> totally uh, agreed. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead, Miranda. I just was going to say, just as you were suggesting, the climate crisis has never been more urgent. That's, that's very clear to everybody here. But it's also, as you were saying, it's about never been more possible to imagine addressing it together in a lasting and profound way. I would say the same thing is true, speaking now more for the United States, just because I'm more familiar with the facts on the ground. But the crisis of racism for American political culture and democracy is being felt very acutely by all of us. But it has also never been more possible to imagine that we can make significant progress in uprooting it because so many people are aware of it and thinking about it and fighting on it. So this is a moment, not just of crisis, but also of a very, very profound and real opportunity to change on all of these intersecting issues. Yeah, I totally agree. So I guess the message for the audience right now is not only is it the time to act because of the urgency of the crisis, but it's we've never had so many opportunities to do it. And in some ways, thanks to COVID, we have activated a lot of um, reflex, a lot of um, um, capacity to unite and to start working together. There are a lot of movement towards collective action that we would have spent years trying to work on that and on collective action uh, if, if it was not for the urgency of the current crisis that we are um, leaving and that, as you say, is a direct result of the world, uh, the industrialized world that we live in and has produced uh, climate change as well. I wanted to listen to you also about the work you do with youth, uh, the mobilization of the youth in different programs that you have and the role that you see for them in um, the just transition. The climate crisis is a crisis of intergenerational justice, right? Every okay. week we delay action on climate means months of intensified suffering for people younger than us. And that's one of, one of the key, um, corn, one of the cornerstones to understand about the importance of the youth movement. Um, that cornerstone that young people have done the least to contribute, by definition, have done the least to contribute to the crisis and will suffer the worst from it, that provides the youth voice with an impeccable moral power uh, to address the situation. So intergenerational communication coming from young people is incredibly powerful and incredibly convincing when people of goodwill are able to hear it. So that's one thing. Um, and then a second thing, um, which is in some ways related is, is that young people, because they've lived longer, have not had the same kind of time to adapt to norms and standards and business as usual. 
it's business as usual that's brought us to this point of unspeakable loss and tragedy and crisis. It's business as usual that will be the end of our civilization and our species. We need to change business as usual completely. And that's what this moment calls us to do. That's what you all are doing in coming together to address climate change as a group. You're, you're rejecting the business as usual of being in individual silos um, and embracing collective action on climate. Young people's voice resonates so loudly, both because of their moral standing on this issue and because of the inter intergenerational injustice that is at the heart of the climate crisis, and also because they have absolutely no time for business as usual. They do not care. They have not accommodated it. They have not made compromises with it. They haven't had time to. And so they have an absolute refusal of the very practices that have brought us to this point. And those two um, qualities of young people together um, make their voices astoundingly powerful in changing the discourse. And you can see that in the United States. The very first youth-led march on climate was very only, only two years and a couple of months ago. Shortly after that sunrise, the, the youth-led movement in the United States occupied the office of the leader of the House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi. Um, which may or may not have reached people's attention here, but it completely changed the discourse in the United States. For example, putting the Green New Deal on the table as a part of uh, mainstream political discourse. So you saw the Green New Deal become a defining part of the American presidential election, which absolutely would not have happened without the youth movement on climate. So relating to that movement is in extremely important in our opinion for every organization that um, is looking to contribute to a broad cultural shift toward action on this crisis because young people will be among the most important leaders um, whose understandings and whose instincts we need to relate to and to follow. Um, and by the way, they're not asking us to be cheerleaders and spectators. What the young leaders we interact with at the Climate Museum tell us is for us to find our own traction and our own power and to use what we have as adults to help them bend the arc. Not to, um, there can be a tendency in the United States to sentimentalize the youth climate movement and to kind of clap politely on the sidelines without taking action ourselves. Uh, and that um, is not what you all are doing in forming your coalition. And it's something um, that we try very hard to encourage other organizations not to do. It's not a time for being on the sidelines. It's a time for getting in the game. For giving them, sorry? For getting in the game. Ah, it's not for a getting, getting yeah, it's in the game. It's not a time game. to cheer on the side. It's a time to be playing and, and, and fighting to win. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, uh, concretely, if you think of a, um, an advice you can give to foundations, Spanish foundations, with regards mm -hmm. to how they can integrate or support the youth movement, what is, it you, what is it you would advise them to do? We came across this experimentally. We created our first program for, for youth um, in conjunction with the first exhibition that I mentioned earlier, the one on yep. Greenlandic ice with the film. And we um, created a day long workshop for young people, high school students. Um, so that's age 13 to 17, give or take in the US, across New York City on arts and sciences. Um, so it's interdisciplinary. And it um, ended in a design competition where teams of young people developed media that was intended to convince their peers to get involved in the climate crisis. So first they went to the exhibition, then they heard an interdisciplinary lecture about the intersection of sciences and arts in communicating about climate. And then they split up into teams and did this design competition and we had a panel of judges. Um, and what they produced in a few short hours on a Sunday was so extraordinary 
that we created a youth advisory council on the spot. And the young people who had come together for this workshop and competition became its founding members. So my first word of advice is that if you, you, you can create a one day long program that will be a lift organizationally, but not a huge lift. It doesn't have to be anything huge. And again, it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, this is a generation that has grown up in increasing levels of social and ecological crisis. And it's a little bit like the contradiction you referred to with coronavirus, Isabel. Mm -hmm. Nobody would ever wish this upon them. Nobody would ever wish that a beloved young person would grow up in an era of increasing inequality, crisis, and environmental devastation. But, and still, growing up that way has created a generation that's capable of unbelievable creativity and leadership in response mm -hmm. to those crises. So what we have found and what we discovered that very first program was with the most minimal amount of mentoring and support and just a little bit of space where they know they're being listened to, young people will do extraordinary things. Mm -hmm. If you create a space and provide just a little bit of support and advice and guidance, it's, you will be astounded by how engaged young people can become. We've seen through our programs, young people who have no experience with climate, no experience with public speaking, no experience with political leadership of any, of any kind, um, go through a training program and become leaders of the student strike movement, Fridays for Future, that has swept across the globe. Um, we've seen them become leaders in their schools and communities. We've seen them perform at the Apollo Theater, which is one of the most famous performance spaces in the United States. They've done incredible things with just the tiniest little bit of support and space. Um, so my main advice is to create that space, to provide a little support, and then to follow the lead of what happens. Um, and you will be inspired and amazed by, by what this generation of young people can accomplish with, with those minimal supports. I think it's, pas it's passionating to see how art can actually be the way and the key to uh, working on the political representation and the access to leadership and power in order to take the decisions to our youth. Right. And um, I think that's very important. That's something, you know, at the beginning I was saying uh, it's a question of first step. It's easy. It's possible. We do have power if you get into motion. And that's one example. I see we have five minutes left and I would like to open the floor to any question that uh, we may have. So these are um, difficult conditions. We're very little people here in the room. There is a lot of people connected um, on the digital platform. So I, I would like just to give one minute in case uh, somebody has a question here. Or Agnieszka, I'm looking at you if somebody in the chat has a specific question for Miranda. Isabel, while we're waiting for the question, I'll say a brief word on arts. Oh, or did you get one? No, 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 I did not. Go on, go on, go okay. on. I just, I, I realized I hadn't, I, I, I meant to say earlier, but neglected um, to do so, that the reason that the work in the arts is so important, and you referenced this with your second and third stages, is it creates an emotional space where people can feel their emotions about the climate crisis, which we all spend a lot of time pushing down and suppressing. I know I do, and I work on climate all the time, yeah. um, but that doesn't mean that we don't spend a lot of time trying to run away from our own feelings about it. When we're in a communal space, and art is of course deeply communal, it's no accident that speech comes from singing, and it's no accident that there are drawings in prehistoric caves. Art's one of the primal um, has gone into the evolution of our, our minds um, in a way that's very, very deep. So art brings us into contact with each other and into contact with our own emotions in a way that makes the deep transformations that we need across the society possible. 
It doesn't execute them on its own, but it makes them possible. Yeah, exactly. It's so deeply rooted in the in our right. humanity that uh, really uh, we need to be working on. And I was wondering when I was listening to you if there is a way for the Spanish foundations to get in contact with you, maybe because I'm seeing the interactivity today is difficult. And um, I am sure some people will be interested in having a chance to uh, interact more with your initiative. So I don't know if maybe to, um, through uh, the Spanish Association of Foundations they can contact and drop an email or, or so. Because the way you have been working with the Climate Museum is really precise, is really, I think, exceptional. And uh, at the same time, we have this cultural sector that is struggling, reinventing its itself in order to be in line and to uh, not uh, show its back to the situation, the social and political situation we are facing, but still having a hard time reinventing the forms in which it can work. And the Climate Museum has so much to bring with that. Do you want to say a word maybe very quickly uh, to, uh, about this, about the forms, the new forms? we are seeing for art in this current situation of coronavirus? Absolutely. We've seen street art. We've seen public spaces take on a new significance. Both of these are incredibly positive developments. And another example of how the coronavirus crisis has created possibilities for a, a snap forward. I don't know if you, I don't know how that expression translates into Spanish, but a sudden leap forward on the climate crisis. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that what's really hard, even for a new institution and incredibly important, is to be open to the process of change, self-assessment, self-criticism if you like, but it doesn't even have to be negative. It's just that this is going to be a changing initiative that we're all engaged in together and recognizing that we have to let go of our attachment to the things that we've done before mm -hmm. and be open to exploring new ways of doing pretty much everything is critical to our progress. It's not easy and it's especially not easy for institutions that have been around for a while. But as I was telling you yesterday, Isabel, even at the Climate Museum, which is a baby, it's brand new. We recognize all the time that we're acquiring habits that we have to get rid of. So even for new organizations, it's hard. Um, and it's a, it's a big challenge, but the best possible and most ambitious and most forward-looking challenge for existing organizations um, like those to which, uh, those that the, everybody listening today lead. And on my contact information, Agnieszka, if you could just put my email address into the chat, that would be fantastic. I'm delighted to be in contact with anybody. If our experience can be of any assistance in the remarkable initiative that you are undertaking with the pact. I would, will be very inspired to be helpful however I can. Um, oh, and my cool. colleagues will be as well. So we look forward to being in further contact and just admire and respect and appreciate what you all are doing so much. Thank you so much, Miranda. Really, your words are touching our hearts, the hearts of all the foundations uh, here uh, united. We'll be in touch with a group of uh, foundations that have, especially those who ha already have a cultural program and are signing the pact because we want to be working together in the right way to harness the power, the, the power and the opportunities that we are seeing in the field. Thank you so much, Miranda. Now we are going to present, uh, to present the pact. So, Everybody, I think um, the message is clear. The question is the first step. It's not difficult. It's the moment, and we need to be changing the game. That's right. Muchísimas gracias a todos.